Hi everybody, this is Scott Saad. I've been away for more than a month on a much needed break, uh, but I am back and ready to resume the battle for good ideas. Uh, I thought what I would do today is maybe discuss a hodgepodge of uh, topics, uh, including uh, some of the books that I read whilst on vacation and some of the interesting podcasts that I listened to. Uh, and this would hopefully serve as a good starting point for the post-summer sad truth season. Uh, so first, a book that uh, I very much enjoyed by Paul Offit, who is a uh, pediatrician and a virologist. Uh, book is titled Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information. Uh, I've been aware of Paul's work for a while, and I'm actually hoping to invite him for a chat on my uh, uh, show at some point in the near future. I very much enjoyed this book because it really is peppered with personal anecdotes. He, he's actually quite a, he seems like an affable uh, character uh, with a good sense of humor, something that I very much appreciate. Uh, but he talks about the science. He talks about bad ideas. For example, he's been a strong uh, voice against the anti-vaxxers, uh, you know, all the celebrities who hold these insanely dangerous positions that have the potential of harming not just themselves or their children, but harming others. Uh, and so this is a book that I truly highly recommend. Uh, regrettably, maybe I should listen here to the old adage, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. The second book that I read, but I haven't finished yet, is this one. Uh, it's identity, the demand and dignity, uh, the demand for dignity and the politics of resentment by Francis Fukuyama, uh, whom I had, you know, heard of his work in the past. But this is, uh, to the best of my recollection, this is the first book that I've actually tried to read from cover to cover, and I found it very, very tedious, very verbose, very long-winded, uh, to ultimately say a few nuggets that most people who are in that space would have already known. So I can't give it quite as strong a recommendation as the first book. So those are the two books that uh, I took to the beach and tried to once in a while tickle my intellectual bone when I wasn't jumping off the dock into the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Um, but I also spent quite a bit of time uh, listening to podcasts uh, whilst exercising in the, uh, in the gym. In the gym. Uh, I haven't been someone who has, uh, you know, been a feverish consumer of podcasts other than producing content. I haven't been much of a consumer of content or, or certainly not as much as I would have liked to. And so here I really tried to assiduously uh, listen to some podcasts that I thought, you know, would, would, uh, uh, be valuable. And so I listened to a few of, uh, Sam Harris's guests, but of course, Sam is someone who, whom I know I've been on the show Two that uh, I thought were really great ones. I mean, several were very nice, uh, but uh, one that I really enjoyed is a cardiologist. I can't remember his name, Eric, I think Eric Topol, uh, who was talking about AI and medicine. Uh, very, very interesting podcast. I really enjoyed uh, their chat, and, and, and I'm certainly uh, interested in uh, inviting uh, Eric uh, on the show. AI is something that is very much within my background. Uh, in 1985, I had taken a course uh, as part of my uh, mathematics and computer science degree uh, in AI, and the professor is someone who had worked on the early uh, a, you know, AI-based uh, chess, uh, chess programs. Uh, and so in the course, we had to program using something called alpha-beta pruning, uh, program a game. Uh, this is where you use algorithms, you use heuristics to prune the search space that the algorithm has to go through in, in making the optimal move. And so I thought that AI was a brilliant course. This is now more than 30 years ago. And at the time, I had specifically uh, taken note of the value of AI in things like medical diagnostics. And this is back in 1985. So it was great to, you know, fast forward 34 years later to see a, uh, a highly respected uh, cardiologist talking about the infusion of AI 
uh, within medicine and uh, really a, a truly humble person from at least from the chat I don't know him personally but from his chat he was just a, a truly lovely fellow and so I look forward to hopefully connecting with him I also listened to a chat uh, that uh, Sam held recently with a infection disease specialist and this is going to uh, take me into a slight detour to discuss evolution and antibiotics. Uh, I've always been very interested in, uh, you know, virus hunters, to put it colloquially. Uh, and as some of you know, of course, I'm working on a book on idea pathogens that basically takes the model of an epidemiologist who studies how does a virus uh, start off with patient zero and then spread. And of course, I apply that mechanism to discuss how bad ideas spread to the populace. And so I listened to to their wonderful chat, uh, which where they talked actually about how evolutionary principles are used when you're discussing things like vaccinations, when you're discussing things like the use of antibiotics. And this is something, of course, that I was very familiar with prior to listening to that podcast. This is something that I've weighed in on, given that, of course, I'm a, an evolutionist. Uh, but I thought I would mention a few uh, tidbits here that relate very much to that particular show. So if you look at, for example, uh, the spread of superbugs, superbugs is really evolution in action because what's happening with the spread of superbug is that the misuse of antibiotics creates the selection environments that permit for the evolution of bugs that are resistant to our lines of, you know, our antibiotic lines of defense. That's one of the great insights from evolutionary medicine. And so this is something that, of course, I was very familiar with prior to listening to Sam's chat with the infectious uh, disease specialist. I, I apologize. I didn't uh, uh, jot down his name, but it, it'd be very easy to find on Sam's uh, website. Uh, and maybe perhaps I'll also invite him for a chat on my show because he seemed quite uh, a lovely fellow uh, in his own right. Uh, so, so the idea, of course, is that these superbugs are evolving precisely because of our misuse of antibiotics. So how do we misuse antibiotics? Well, one way we do so is uh, by overusing them. And so in, in, in the podcast in question, the infectious disease specialist talks about uh, the tension that arises where, say, for example, a surgeon uh, orders the, uh, you know, that, that, that a post-operative patient receives some uh, antibiotic just to be on the safe side to as an insurance policy but then i can't remember what he called them i think he called them uh, antibiotic advocates but then that order has to go through someone who says yay or nay and and this gentleman in question was saying that in many cases you know he has to hold very difficult conversations with the surgeon to tell him no it's not appropriate to use this particular uh antibiotic yes for the specific purpose of your patient, you might want to play it safe, but from a more collective perspective, from a more aggregate perspective, the the using a antibiotic that you otherwise shouldn't have been using uh, is not a very good thing and, and is one of the many factors that results potentially in the evolution of these superbugs. But of course, the number one reason why these superbugs evolve is because of the uh, poor manner by which uh, the consumers of the antibiotics, the patients, misuse uh, the prescription. So typically it used to be in the past, I think, uh, antibiotics was a 10-day course. Uh, and then I think now you, you can it's been shortened to five days in many cases. So you, let's say you have uh, a bacterial bronchitis. So you're put on antibiotics. After a day or two, what happens? You feel a lot better, right? You feel good. And so you end up stopping the antibiotic. But in doing so, what ends up happening is you've created the perfect selection environment for the weaker uh, bacteria to die out. But then by not pushing through for the five days, you've selected for the strong ones to survive. And so either because of the overuse of antibiotics or the misuse of antibiotics, whether it be from physicians overprescribing, whether it be from consumers, patients not using the antibiotic properly, it has led to uh, the so-called evolution of these superbugs. And so the infectious disease specialist was, 
I, I hope he wasn't being alarmist, but he was saying basically that, uh, you know, by 2050, I think he was saying more people might die from a resurgence of infectious dis diseases that we thought we had left behind in our rearview mirror than, than deaths from some of the current top killers. Uh, so that I thought was very interesting. And I wanted to link it to actually a personal anecdote. Uh, our first uh, Belgian shepherd who passed away in 2012, uh, when he was two years old, he was diagnosed with a condition called the uh, prostatitis, which is a bacterial infection of the prostate. And usually the course of action that vets recommend is that you go ahead and uh, castrate him because then that, then that causes the prostate to shrink and the problem is resolved. I wasn't willing to do that. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, follow a more sort of traditional medical intervention by having them prescribe strong antibiotics to try to kill the, the, uh, the bacterial infection in the prostate. And so for the next three years or so, we kept doing that. So, you know, he, his symptoms would subside, get better. Usually the symptoms were that he would get a, uh, a blood. You'd have blood droplets on the floor. You'd notice that. And that's how you would know that his symptoms are flaring up. Uh, but then by the age of five, in one of these resurgences of his prostatitis, uh, the, the surgeon contacted me and said, look, I understand you're, 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 you know, you're tepid about castrating him, but at this point, it'll save his life. We really have to move forward with it. Uh, and at that point, I actually ended up uh, extracting uh, through a reproductive specialist his sperm. Talk about how much you might love his, your dog. Uh, and then we ended up having to castrate him. But why am I talking about all this? Because... Uh, the surgeon explained to me, not using evolutionary terms, but he explained to me that one of the problems with uh, treating uh, prostatitis with an antibiotic is that the prostate is a reservoir that is very good at hiding some bacteria. And so what ends up happening is you prescribe antibiotics for his prostatitis. You think that you've solved it, you've cured it, but the reality is there's always some bacteria that are hiding in these little sponges in the in the in the prostate itself and so when it comes back it now comes back with a more virulent with a more nasty with a super bug uh, you know manifestation of that bacteria and then that keeps going until a few years later you have to castrate them so i thought that uh, usually when we talk about uh, evolution and vaccines or evolution and antibiotics uh, we're talking about in the human context, but here I thought prostatitis of my Belgian shepherd was a was a good example of how evolution was at work uh, within his prostate, uh, which of course, by the way, speaks to the fact that evolutionary principles is not some you know esoteric theoretical thing that only evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary biologists sit around pontificating in their ivory towers. They are really very powerful. Uh, applied insights that can be reaped in understanding evolutionary theory, whether it be in architecture or in consumer psychology, as I use it, or in medicine, or in law, and so on and so forth. Those of you who watch this show probably have seen me talk about the applicability of evolutionary theory in many contexts. Uh, I wanted to talk about a few other podcasts that I came across, so I certainly tried to catch up on a few um, Sam's, uh, some, you know, a few shows on, on Sam Harris's podcast, which you know, historically, I haven't listened to many, and maybe I need to go back and try to listen to a few, because as I said, some of his recent guests were truly fantastic choices. Uh, but I discovered a new podcast that I wasn't aware of uh, until this uh, trip that I was on. This is a brain science uh, podcast uh, uh, hosted by Ginger Campbell, who is a physician by training. And she brings in all sorts of very interesting neuroscience folks to discuss all sorts of really interesting things. And uh, so several here that I want to mention, at one point I tweeted about this and some people wrote back, you know, what's the podcast? What's the link and so on. And as I said, I was trying to stay away from social media so I didn't respond to the people, but I knew that eventually I would give people more details about the podcast in question. So as I said, it's Brain Science Podcast with uh, Ginger Campbell. I feel like I am being, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting I'm doing nothing but promoting other people's work this time around, but that's that's also important, right? Uh, 
uh, we engage in self-promotion, but we also should be promoting uh, the work of others if we think they are worthy of such promotion. Um, so one of the podcasts that I really enjoyed, uh, a separate podcast, two separate people, but they were really on the op- opposing ends of a debate uh, relating to the value of brain imaging. Uh, so this is, for example, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, I've written several papers, uh, two papers, actually, uh, one with a former uh, graduate student who is now, I think, the director of the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, Justin Garcia, where we were criticizing the fMRI paradigm precisely because uh, it often is a, a theoretical exploration. You you know you go fishing for effects, and then whatever comes up, you come up with post hoc explanations. And also, we were lamenting the fact that so little of the fMRI uh, paradigm was rooted in, uh, you know, was was guided by evolutionary principles, and we thought that certainly evolutionary cognitive neuroscience could offer a lot of otherwise uh, uh, invisible insights, insights that people wouldn't have thought of. It really is one of those cases where the the proverbial uh, uh, tail is wagging the dog, or whatever the expression is. But you have this great tool, this great methodology, and people become fixated on the methodology, on the sophistication of the methodology, and uh, the theoretical rigor be damned, we've got this really great toy, let's play with it. Uh, And I subsequently, a few years later, wrote another article in Frontiers in Human Neuroscience with one of my former postdocs, uh, Gil Green uh, Gross, where we specifically uh, took up that topic again. So I was really interested in listening to uh, this debate on whether the fMRI paradigm is truly valuable or not. And the two guys, both of whom I've cited in my own work, uh, who were guests on this Brain Science podcast were Russell Poldrack, who uh, is now at Stanford, but I think in the past he was at UCLA, who has done some fantastic work you know, using the fMRI uh, methodology. And on the other end of that debate... Uh, is a gentleman who I didn't know until I listened to the show, has passed away, regrettably. His name is uh, William Utal, who wrote a book, I don't remember the exact title of the book, but basically he was arguing that uh, fMRI is nothing more than the latest instantiation of phrenology. For those of you who don't know what phrenology is, this is where, uh, this is about 150 years ago, where you had folks, serious uh, scientists, uh, argue that by looking at the structure, the actual crevice, the, the the morphology of your cranial structure, you can infer all sorts of things about people. You know, oh, gee, you have a you have a little lump here. This must mean that you lack temerity. And of course, this this was quack science. It was complete garbage. And and Utal is arguing that phrenology is really, uh, not phrenology, uh, brain brain imaging uh, paradigm is really the 20th and 21st century version of that old antiquated quackery known as phrenology. Now, of course, I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't quite think that brain imaging is phrenology. Maybe that's too strong a term, but I do believe that there are some very, very serious uh, conceptual theoretical uh, problems with uh, brain imaging. And as I said, I had independently uh, written several uh, critiques of the paradigm. Uh, I also, from that same uh, podcast, listened uh, to uh, two podcasts by a, and again, forgive me, the, his name escapes me, a Italian uh, physician who studies the neurobiology of, the, of uh, placebo effects. And he made sure to state that the, the, the word placebo effects in plural is really important. There isn't a singular placebo effect. Uh, different uh, placebo effects, if you like, activate or involve different neuronal systems. And therefore, to discuss of the placebo effect as though it were all utilizing you know, this one set of uh, neuroanatomical systems... Uh, is incorrect. And so I really learned a lot. I mean, of course, I knew quite a bit about the placebo effect in general, just as a you know, experimental behavioral science person. But uh, 
learning about the neurobiology of placebo effects was fantastic stuff. Um, so there you have it. I've given you some of the, at least one book to read, another one to potentially avoid, some fantastic brainy, forgive the pun, uh, podcasts to listen to. Uh, never forget that we are always learning. I remain a student forever. And oftentimes people write to me and say, you know, what's what's your secret to, to life, Professor Saad, and what keeps you happy and so on? Well, one of the things that keeps me happy is to know that, that uh, there's no end to how much knowledge there is to, to learn and how little uh, any of us actually know. And every day I can get on some intellectual journey that the day before I was unaware of. So that's certainly one of the things that's very exciting about life. Uh, I look forward to bringing you many exciting new guests this year. Uh, my next step, of course, is to try to submit, not to try, I have to submit uh, my latest book to my publisher in the next month or so. And then hopefully we can resume a regular cadence of the show. If you appreciate what I do, uh, I can tell you that I've taken a huge hit uh, through Patreon and through all of the other portals uh, for all sorts of reasons uh, that have nothing to do with me. Uh, many people got off these portals because they were boycotting Patreon and so on. So if you think that what I'm doing is valuable and you'd like to contribute, you can certainly try to support me through PayPal, through Patreon, through Subscribestar. You can buy merchandise. I always feel unsure uh, about how much I should be asking for people's support. But I think you you, you do need to remind people that this is all done uh, as free content using my own time. So if you appreciate what I do, please consider supporting me, discussing this show with your friends, sharing it, commenting, wh whatever you can do to help promulgate good ideas uh, is certainly welcome. So there you have it, folks. Now I look forward to having this glorious tan slowly dissipate as I sink into the despair of the frozen tundra. But hopefully we still have a few more months of good weather in Montreal. Great to be back. Thank you to everyone who has written to me with wonderful comments and so on. I haven't gotten into my emails yet. So if you haven't heard from me, this is likely because I haven't read your email over the past month. Take care, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.